Please remain standing for the gospel lesson, which will be read today for us by Emerson Plummer. It's found in Mark chapter 9. We will, the scripture reading today will be from Mark 9, 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took him, Peter, James, and John, and, le and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Congregation may be seated. And thanks to Addie for helping Emerson read the scripture today. Let's pray together. May your spirit, O oh God, stand between me and your people so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together will be transformed into what you want us each to hear from your scripture and what we need to be and become as your people. For these things we pray in the name of Christ. And all of God's people did say, Amen. I guess I'm in a whole new season with my mother these days as it relates to technology. This week, my phone was ringing, my cell phone, and I get the notification on my watch and I go to try to find my cell phone, but by the time I get there, it is rung several times. And so I begin to look and she's FaceTiming me. Now, my mother has her phone connected to her hearing aids. So oftentimes all she does to hear, she'll hold the phone out like this and just speak into the speaker. And so I answer the phone, and I'm looking at the ceiling of the house inside. <laughs> and I said, hey, Mom. And she said, well, why are you FaceTiming me? I said, Mom, I, I, you called me. She said, no, I called you on your cell phone. I didn't FaceTime you. I said, well, M Mom, we're FaceTiming, and I answered your call. And then she said, well, how did I do that? <laughs> I don't know, Mom. I don't know. And sure enough, there's like a one minute and 45 second message on my cell phone. How does my mother, who can't turn on an iPhone sometimes, simultaneously make a cell phone call and a FaceTime call? I don't know how that happened. All I can tell you is it happened. And when we come to this transfiguration text, I can't tell you how it happened. All I can tell you is it happened. Now, transfiguration is when we celebrate what happened in the person of Christ as he takes James, Peter, and John, and he goes to a high mountain. Tradition holds when you visit the Holy Land, they'll march you up to Mount Carmel, you'll look over the Jezreel Plain, over the valley, and you'll see basically Mount Tabor in the distance. It's just on the western side, eastern side of the Valley of Elah, where David faced Goliath. And that's where tradition holds that the transfiguration took place. But... Scripture does not say that it was Mount Tabor. And if we look at the text itself and we let the text speak to us, we find both in Matthew and in Mark, Jesus has just been in Caesarea Philippi, which is on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee. And if we listen to the text that says he took James, Peter, and John to a high mountain place, it was away from activity. It probably was moving to the north, the slopes of Mount Hermon, where the transfiguration took place. But regardless of whether it's Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon, I don't know how it happened, but it happened. And what happens in that moment is that 
James, Peter, and John are with Jesus. Luke says they were sleeping and then awoke. Seems to be sort of a, a sort of common theme with the disciples. They tend to drift off when Jesus takes them places. But they look and there is Jesus transfigured, radiant. Mark says like nothing on this world can bleach. The NIV says like nobody could wash clothes cleaner. And so there's a radiance about who Jesus is, but it wasn't like there was an exterior light. It's not like these TV lights glaring down on me. It wasn't a light coming from the outside. It was a radiance coming from the inside that was reflected to those who were there. And here's Elijah, and here's Moses. Why Elijah and Moses to be transfigured? And the other thing that Mark tells us very clearly is that James and Peter and John, Peter exactly, well, let's build three buildings. The technical word is, in the Greek, three tabernacles, little tents for one of each of you. But they recognize Elijah and Moses. Well, if we work backward through time, some 900 years previous, you had Elijah, the prophet Elijah, who was taken up by a chariot of fire into heaven. Elijah represents the one who will come before the return of the Messiah. You find that in Malachi chapter 4 specifically, as it says, I will first send Elijah back. Even within the Jewish Passover Seder meal. So the Seder meal is what becomes our Holy Communion. That Seder meal... In Passover, there is a cup of Elijah that is at the very end of the meal. And at the very end of the meal, they'll lift up the cup of Elijah, and the youngest child will go open the door to look and see if Elijah has come, that the people of Israel might return to Jerusalem, and the Messiah return to see. The Messiah has come, and Elijah is there. So it's Elijah who is the prophet, who represents the coming. Now, if you read verses 11, 12, and 13 after this passage, you'll find that that's un- unpacked a little bit as the disciples say, why do the scribes say, first Elijah, then the Messiah? And Jesus once again says, well, I tell you, Elijah has already come, and the Messiah must go the way of contempt and suffering. And then Moses. Hopefully, you all know that Moses is the one who was the deliverer of the Ten Commandments. He seems the giver of the law. In fact, we refer to the first five books of the Bible is the Pentateuch because there's five of them. We also call them the books of Moses. Not that Moses scribed them, but that's how powerful a figure. So you have this prophet who will precede the Messiah. You have the one who is the giver of the law flanking Jesus. And they're in conversation. We don't know what they're talking about. But this is a moment before Jesus moves to Jerusalem to recognize who Christ is in Mark's narrative. And then Mark tells us something important. Peter just ready, is ready to stay right there. He, he's ready just to camp out. Let's build three buildings, three tabernacles. The tabernacle would be when the people of Israel were traveling, basically a large tent area. Let's just hang on right here. I like where we are. Have you ever been in that place in life? I like this spot. I don't want to move. I don't want to go. I just want it to be just like this. And we all want this just freeze frame. I don't want anything to change. When I was at Bear Creek and I met this church, and they know this story because uh, the intern who served with us from Perkins School of Theology there actually wrote what's called an immersion report. I always find it funny that Perkins, the Methodist Seminary, calls it an immersion report when we sprinkle, but we can't immerse. And he talks about, um, Will talks about, here's three weeks of my experience within the life of the church. Here's what I think I'm recognizing in this church. And he shares that with his learning committee, and it's really fascinating. We shared it with the entire congregation because Will said in his summary, I find that this church is perfectly willing to make any change that will take it back to the way it used to be. Hear that again. This church is perfectly willing to make any change that will take it back to the way it used to be. There's a familiarity that we like in life. And Peter is in that place. But have you ever really thought about mountaintops? Think about a majestic peak. A majestic peak. Thousands of feet up. It's a mountaintop experience, we say spiritually, don't we? Mountaintop experience. What lives on the mountaintop? Nothing. The air is thin. There may be some ice, but there's very little hydration and there is no nutrition. Whereas conversely, everything you need to live life 
is found in the valley. The valley is where the rivers run, where all the water and sustenance of life takes place, and you get the nutrients for life. And yet we've borrowed this imagery that if we're going to be in a spiritually good place, we're on a mountaintop experience, and if we're in a bad place, we call it a valley. What if we flip the metaphor? What if we transformed and transfigured the metaphor and understood, yes, mountaintop experiences happen, but God nourishes us, feeds us, equips us. <coughs> in the valleys where all that we need for the nourishment of life comes. Are you perfectly willing to stay where you are, clinging in hopes that they'll just take it back to the way it used to be? My friends, tomorrow's coming. Not a one of us has been there yet, and we'll all be there tomorrow. We can't, walk, we can't go back in time. We can choose the present, which will determine what happens in the future. But we can't go back. And so we have to ask, what is the importance of transfiguration for you and me? Well, I want to ask you a few questions for that, for your faith. As you think about what voices you listen to, who do you hear speaking into your life in this world? Who do you hear speaking into your life in this world? And if you don't spend time in the reading of Scripture or with your brothers and sisters in Christ, you create a great opportunity for something less than the will of God and the presence of God to speak into your life. But when you spend time in Scripture, when you pause the busyness of this world and you read Scripture, you let God speak into your life. Second question, what do you see in life? Do you see Christ present in the world? James, Peter, and John recognized that this was Christ. They recognized Elijah and Moses in this great cloud, and the clouds are always representative of God's presence. It's from a pillar of cloud that, that in the book of Exodus, as the people are fleeing, God protects the people. It's from a pillar of cloud that Moses encounters God in the writing of the Ten Commandments, in the pillar of cloud that Jesus will ascend. Clouds are throughout the scriptures to represent an encounter with God. So your encounter with God, what are you seeing? What do you hear? And do you filter it in such a way that makes you just want to be comfortable? Because the text is wonderful when it says, when they saw all this, they were terrified. Not terrified as we use in the English vernacular, in a sense of being afraid, but terror in a sense of awe and wonder, saying, how can this be explained? I don't know. And so I want to tell you that the good news of the gospel today is that there are things that are going to happen to you that no person will adequately explain. You will wonder why something has happened, an accident or a diagnosis. I will never, I don't think anyone will be able to adequately explain to you the whys of it happening, but I can tell you who's with you in the midst of the journey, the one who can bring light out of darkness, who can bring life from death, whose very touch can be healing. I don't know about what challenges you face, but I promise you that if you'll spend time in the reading of Scripture and in the fellowship of those who are in Christ, you will hear them speak into your life. You will find words of encouragement, and oftentimes you will find that when you think it's going good, it's probably not as good as you think. And when it's going bad, it's probably not as bad as you think. And the beautiful thing is when you journey as the body of Christ together, there's always someone to celebrate with in times of joy and someone to lean on in times of difficulty. Who speaks into your life and who do you allow to speak into your life? And do you see Christ present? You know, if you and I are going to be the body of Christ in the world, then we're going to have to be able to be willing to let the mystery of who God is speak into our life in ways that we may not be able to explain but we know what happened. J.B. Phillips says it best when he says that if your God fits in a box, then your God is too small. And if we unpack what that says, often when we approach Scripture with the knowledge and scientific information and logic that we have today, we think there should be no mystery. We should be able to explain everything. As one young child in this congregation said to me a couple of weeks ago, where did God come from? So next time they do that, I'm like, go ask Pastor Kevin. He knows that answer. 
there is a part of the mystery, the part of what we have to lean into that we may not be able to logically explain, but we know is there. We know is there. We know it happened. But has it happened in your heart? Has it happened in your life? In the old language of the church, have you laid down your burdens and given them to God so that you walk in a lighter way? Have you asked God for forgiveness for that? Something that's going on that's just holding you back in a place in the past that won't let you live in the present or move to the future? Or are you just perfectly content to make any kind of change in life that'll take it back to the way it used to be? I want to close by sharing with you something that Reverend Billy Strayhorn tells about from Port Arthur, Texas. In Port Arthur, Texas, there is a children's home that is a combination of both a place of hospice care and a place of education. It's a place where the life is nurtured as much as possible, but the diagnosis means life is not as long for the children as it will be for the others. There are three women in a local church, and Strayhorn says that these three women didn't physically adopt, but they spiritually adopted one young man at the direction of the home. And those three women, every day of the week, would go in and read to the young man who was unable to read, but he loved reading. He couldn't do that anymore. They would read to him. And when the one finished several hours, the next one would come in, and they would continue reading. And when the second one finished, the third one would come in and reading. And what's wrote about that is this. That that young boy who was despondent and depressed became responsive. And even though the spark of his life would soon leave him, they wrote, it got brighter, not dimmer. And though the boy had died, his life had been changed forever. I like the imagery of you and I making a choice. Do we live what Paul says to fan into flame the hope that is within you? Do we encourage that? Do we kindle that in each other? Do we do so in the world? Or do we just simply step back from anything that would change or challenge us that doesn't fit and get God in a comfortable little box? You see a nice small God who doesn't challenge us. But let me let you know the real news. A God that fits in a box is not a God that's filled with grace or can forgive. And if you'll just be willing to let the mystery of who God is be the mystery of God, then you leave room for things that you may not be able to know how it happened, but it happened. How is it, Kevin, that in five, six years ago, we would not really participate and feed a bunch of kids? And now we do. How is it, Sandra Watts, that we and Peggy Bruckner and Jim Zilkowski and you beautiful people who show up on Monday nights at Heal the City, how is it that three years ago we didn't see who our neighbor was or welcome him with graceful arms, and now we do? How is it, church, that eight years ago you didn't have a place that could fill every parking spot on Polk Street, in the church, and across the street, but now you do? And people are knowing the grace and the love of God. I don't really know how that happened. Oh, I can explain to you bricks and mortar and invitations in the insert. But you know what? I really don't know how it happened. But because of what I see, I know that it has happened and it is happening. And as much as you and I are willing, it will continue to happen. Let's pray together. God, we're so grateful for your grace that love that's never dependent upon where we are or what we've done. So awaken us to the gift of your presence with us today. Help us be people who are willing to let the love of Christ transfigure who we are, transform our heart to move tears of sadness to tears of thankfulness for a new chapter in life, for tears of regret and times of what we wish we had not done to know that we have been forgiven and we are people who are loved by you. Give us, O oh God, a heart to move into the world this day. Because as much as this sanctuary has been such a warm and comfortable place to be outside 17 degrees and 30 mile an hour winds, 
when we walk to our cars and we feel that bitter cold, help us pause to remember that life without your love feels the same. And give us a burning passion to share in a practical and invitational way the love of Jesus that's always welcomed us and always will. For these things we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people did say, Amen.